number 14 in your hymnal, page number 14. We're going to sing some more songs about praising the Lord, just as we did this morning. Page number 14, the song, Be Thou Exalted. Again, it may not be as familiar of a song, but I think you'll catch on to it if you've not heard it before. Page number 14, let's stand as we sing. Be thou exalted forever and ever, God of eternity, the ancient of days, wondrous in majesty, so mighty in wisdom, perfect in holiness and worthy of praise. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels, be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Verse 3. Be thou, verse number 3. Here we go. Be thou exalted, O Spirit eternal. Dwell in our hearts, keep us holy within. Feed us each day with thy heavenly manna, healer of wounded hearts, thy praises we sing. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their rapture adore thee, thine be the glory forever. Amen. For this song tonight, we only sang verses one through three, but I do want you to notice how this song is structured. Verse number one talks about the God of eternity, the ancient of days, God the Father. Verse number two, be thou exalted, O son of the highest. Verse number three, be thou exalted, O spirit eternal. You see the Trinity there. You see all of the Godhead there lifted up in song, lifted up in praise. Great song to start out with tonight. Well, it is an exciting night tonight. Uh, I, I'm excited about the opportunity to get to preach. I'm excited about uh, the party we're going to have with celebrating Miss Karen's retirement from uh, working over at Bethel. But I know you're not done working. I know you're still going to keep serving in ministry here. She's at the piano again tonight, as you can see. But uh, appreciate her faithfulness in ministry and uh, Christian education over at Bethel. And then, uh, so we're going to be celebrating that. And it's also good to have with us Mike and Ruth Shell uh, here to celebrate that as well. So a great night together. And I trust you're excited about what the Lord is going to teach us from the Word of God. And that you're ready and looking forward to that. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord to work in our hearts. Our Father, we're grateful for those that you have gathered here tonight. And we're uh, looking forward, we're anticipating what the Lord is going to teach us from the Word of God. Our Lord, we ask that you will help us to focus tonight uh, and, and to uh, have our hearts prepared for what, for what you have for us from the Word. Lord, uh, there's a lot of folks traveling right now. There's different ones that are uh, sick with various things, and they're not able to be here, Lord, but we ask that you'll raise them up. We ask for safety for those that are traveling and Lord, for those of us that are gathered here tonight, we ask that you will work in our hearts, that you'll, that you'll teach us, and that we will be ready to do whatever the Holy Spirit will bid us to do through the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, it's, it's a special night, and uh, we're, we're grateful for what we get to celebrate with Miss Karen and how you've used her uh, in, in Christian education, Lord, such a vital thing in training up our young people and so, Lord, we pray that this will be a night where ultimately, even as, as this song just stated, we pray that this will be a night where our Savior is exalted in all that we say and do. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, 
Son, for the Trinity three in one, for the goodness of your love, I will praise you, Lord, for the giving of your grace, for the miracles of each day, for the life that shows my way. so much choir let's turn to number 392 in our hymnal 392 the song tis so sweet to trust in jesus 392 tis so sweet to trust in jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. number four don't miss how the text changes here the first couple verses have been saying um, how sweet it is to trust Jesus verse number four I'm so glad I learned to trust him I trust that that I hope that's true of every one of us tonight the the process of trusting God never stops it's never over there's always going to be another lesson to learn there's always going to be something else no matter your age no matter you're at where you're at in your stage of life there's always going to be something else 
I need to learn to trust the Lord. And so the songwriter says, I'm so glad I learned to trust him. And that is true in the sense that hopefully in every life, every believer, you can look back and see some way in which you have learned to trust him in the past. But that doesn't mean you've arrived yet. It doesn't, I don't think that's what the songwriter meant either, that, okay, I've learned this lesson. We're done. We can move on. No, I don't think that's what it means. But, hey, I trust that each of us can look back and say, yes, I'm so glad I learned to trust him through that scenario. Let's sing along. Verse number four. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be Right, this week, please make it a matter of prayer as our juniors head off to junior camp tomorrow. They will be there all week, and we are excited about what God is going to do. We love camp. We love sending our juniors and our teens to camp. And so tomorrow, our juniors head out, and they'll be at camp Monday through Saturday. Looking ahead, then, we got teen camp July 11th through 15th, and then that Sunday night, July 17th, we have our snack and Singspiration. Please bring your favorite ice cream. Uh, that'd be a good night to be here, wouldn't it? Bring your favorite ice cream here for our snack and Singspiration, July 17th evening service. Bring your favorite ice cream. There will be water available. But then also feel free to find your favorite hymn and the number thereof in the hymnal and write that down. You can drop a note in the offering plate uh, with your favorite hymn and hymn number, and we'll sing it that night at our Singspiration. Looking forward to that. Always love having our time together opening the hymnal and singing. All right, VBS Day is August 6th. Uh, please look at your emails this week. I'll probably com be communicating with a number of you via email, trying to send some notes out and uh, get more information into your hands and see uh, who is available to do a number of different things. We're going to need a lot of hands for that event, VBS Day, August 6th, and uh, we'll get more information to you in the days ahead. All right, Pine Car Derby. Some of you have already purchased cars. You're out to win. Some of you, Paul, need to get your car so you can try to win. You already got cars. Oh, man. All right. They've been well-seasoned, I guess. <laughs> Pine Car Derby kits, if you need a car, $5 per kit. All ages are welcome to participate in the various divisions. You can see me to buy those, and the Pine Car Derby is August 19th through 20th. If you're wondering what the Pine Car Derby is, talk to Paul. He can tell you all about it and what that thing's like. It's a lot of fun. Church family really enjoys it. All right, let's turn to number 524 in our hymnal. 524. Is Miss Gwen in here? You are. Miss Gwen, we're going to sing the song you talked to me about. <laughs> all right, 524 is the song Seeking the Lost. All right, this song, uh, it's structured just a little bit differently. It's a mission song, but I wanted to squeeze this in before the singspiration. The next couple weeks were booked up. So 524, what's that? I, I do it, <laughs> and I, I wanted you to know I did pick it out as a congregation. All right, the song Seeking the Lost, the way this thing is laid out, um, we're going to sing through verse number one on the first page. You'll sing through the chorus. There's an ending, and you jump back to the chorus again to finish off the chorus. So we have a number of different hymns laid out like that, so if maybe you're not familiar with it, uh, I'll try and sing it, and you listen to me and follow along. All right, Seeking the Lost, let's stand as we sing. Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the Master speaking today. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wander back again. Redeemer, Jesus, the Lamb for sinners. Sin. 
I can't hit that last note. All right, how many? First time for you. First time singing. Oh, all right, all right. But Miss Gwen knew it. Miss Gwen knew it, okay? So we got it in. Miss Gwen, we're singing it. All right, we're going to do uh, verse number three as our last. Here we go. Thus I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus away, giving a fall. Hold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. All right, not too bad. Was that good, Miss Gwen? All right, let's have a seat. Thank you so much for your willingness to sing some new songs today. At this time, we're going to have some special music. I'll invite my wife to come up. You got the number there, dear? All right, I'll get this out of the way then. Thank you, Miss Karen. <laughs> well, it's good to have John here with us. <laughs> and Mike and Ruth both. Let's take our Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. 
No, it is good to see Mike and Ruth and John be able to slip in here for tonight. Hey, retirement is worth celebrating, amen. <laughs> no, it's good. I'm glad that they can make it here and we can have some time together. I've had uh, one individual remind me already, you know, that there's food in the fellowship hall, so we're watching the clock, right? <laughs> Oh, they were just messing. They were just joking around a little bit. But I will keep it in mind. He is serious. Hey, my stomach's telling me as well, brother, so <laughs> it's duly noted. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 tonight. Colossians chapter 3. Tonight's message, it, uh, it has been born out of a desire in my heart at times to ask the question why, in a good way, ask the question why of why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do, particularly within the local church? In order for an organization to remain true to its core values, it is necessary and profitable at times for that organization to remind its people of why it does what it does. Businesses practice this quite regularly. They will spend significant sums of money to have annual seminars and training to remind their management teams and their employees of their core values. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've had those seminars, you've had those training sessions. Ron's like, yes, government, we had those all the time, all right? If you've worked in one of the Fortune 500 companies, big retail, wherever, if you've worked in a larger company, chances are you have been subjected to those annual meetings where you review for the umpteenth time the core values of that business, whatever it may be. How uh, uh, Each business has their own business culture. Each business has their own values that they espouse and that they really try to push uh, to their employees. Before I came to New Testament, my employer that I worked for require, would require all employees to take their CBLs by a certain deadline. CBL, that stood for computer-based learning. You may have heard me tell you about that before. Uh, CBLs, they, they could cover a variety of topics. Some of it was legal matters that was required by federal law where uh, you, you, were, you had to cover those things because the government said so. Some of it was safety related. All right, we would have safety related videos that we would watch, what to do if there was a tornado warning, uh, what to do if uh, there was a bomb threat, what to do if you got a paper cut, you know, here's the process for cleaning up, you know, uh, all those kinds of things. But some of those CBLs, computer-based learning that we had to do, some of it was regarding core values. It was a company's way of saying, here's why we do what we do. You don't have to worry this evening. I'm not going to do any CBLs. We're not going to show any uh, safety videos from the 1990s. Uh, that, that's what my company did. You, they, you would watch these safety videos that were like from the dark ages, it felt like, and you would watch the same ones every year. We're not going to do that tonight, all right? But tonight, this evening, I do want to remind you of why we do something in our local church. I'll begin by raising this question for you to consider. Why do we sing as a congregation? Why do we sing as a congregation? I mean, you see the title up here, Why We Sing of Our God, and, and, and we do that in a variety of ways. We incorporate music into a, a, uh, a primary aspect of our service. Of course, preaching is, is primary. That's what we emphasize. We emphasize. We believe that is the biblical pattern. We see that example espoused through the prophets. We see it through the ministry of Christ. He used preaching to communicate truth. But why do we sing of our God? Why do we have congregational singing in our services? If I were to broaden that question, why is singing vital? a vital part of a Bible-believing church. Is it something we do simply out of tradition? Or do we find a pattern, an example in Scripture? What does singing accomplish? Have you ever wondered that? Like, like, like do we just do this just to do it and to fill time <laughs> before the preaching begins? Or is there actually a purpose involved? There is, all right? And we want to we wanna ask that. What does singing accomplish? Why is everyone welcome and encouraged to participate 
particularly in congregational singing, regardless of vocal ability. I mean, we all want to strive for excellence in all that we do, but when it comes to congregational singing, you are a choir together lifting up your voice in song. And it is intended for every single person here, particularly those that know Christ as their Savior. So what does this accomplish? Why do we welcome and encourage this? I have you turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to use this kind of as our theme text, but I'm going to be taking you through Scripture, and I'll just tell you in advance, you're welcome to turn or you're welcome to just listen. But Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16, we find this command where the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Colossae, and he says, chapter 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. He commands them in this. Think about the words of Christ. Let it dwell in you. Meditate upon the word of Christ. Let it permeate your being, your mind, your heart. He says to do that by teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And he goes on, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. This was something he told the church at Colossae. So we find it in the New Testament. But I want to bring you to this point this morning or this evening. We're, we're going to look at a, a good bit of material throughout the Word of God, and then there's going to be some principles at the end that, is, that I want you to write down that I think is critical in guiding us in reasons why we sing. But I want you to see, first of all, here tonight, throughout the Bible... People have worshipped God through song. Throughout the Bible, people have worshipped God through song. It is, uh, the, the word fun is cheap, but it's, it, it fits. It's fun, it's enjoyable to do topical studies throughout the Bible and to just start noting all the instances where music is mentioned or where singing is mentioned. I want to kind of take you through a little road trip real quick. All right? Throughout the Bible, people have worshipped God through song. We could look at individuals. We could look at a variety of individuals, but just some that I want to mention to you. First of all, would be Deborah and Barak. Deborah and Barak. If you want to consider some individuals that worship God through song, Judges chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Just listen to these passages as I read, but here's some individuals that worship God through song. They have a great victory, and then Judges chapter 5, verse 1. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying... Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. So we see an Old Testament example of individuals who lifted up their voice in singing, the Bible says. They wrought a great victory, and they praised the Lord through song. Here's another one from the New Testament. Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas, in the most unlikely of circumstances, we find them doing what? Singing. Acts chapter 16, verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. We find these individuals singing, in the most unlikely of place, the prison at Philippi. Paul and Silas, in the New Testament, singing praises unto God. So we see individuals doing this throughout the Bible, but here's a really neat one. Here's a really neat one. There's also choirs. Choirs. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the temple worship, we come across choirs. In the, the choirs, as we consider the temple dedication in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse number 13, the Bible says, It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one. They were united. They were united in song. They were united in, in noise. They were united in their music together. Came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, sounds like they had quite the orchestra, and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. I would have loved to have heard this choir. 
wouldn't you? I mean, there were, it says, it, it continues on in the, in, the, in the narrative how that there was a, uh, different singers by courses, so they were all arranged, they were all uh, instructed, they were organized, we have a choir, we try to make it organized, <laughs> all right? Hey, it's the same pattern as the Old Testament, all right? Organized, structured music, orchestra played, the singer sang, the trumpeters trumped, the singer sang, they all did it together. They serve together as a choir. And so we find it in the Old Testament temple dedication. But then we also see it in the life and ministry of Ezra and the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So we see choirs. We see individuals, we see choirs throughout the Old Testament. But up to this point, especially considering the choirs, you, you kind of tend to think of uh, 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 trained or professional singers, all right? But I want you to take you to a third group, and that would be congregations. Congregations and groups throughout the scriptures. First one I would mention is Moses and the children of Israel. The first time that singing is mentioned in the Bible is Exodus chapter 15. We could go to Genesis 4 and we could see uh, instances of music and makers of instruments being mentioned in Genesis chapter 4, verse number 27. So music is something that has existed since the earliest of human history. But the first time that singing is mentioned in the Bible is Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. I'm sure singing happened long before that. But it's the first time recorded in Scripture. Exodus 15, verse 1 the first mention of singing in the Bible, it says this, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. We get this impression from this text that this was just the congregation. This was just a large group of people. It wasn't necessarily a, a, a trained choir. It wasn't necessarily set up and organized like the choirs of the temple. It was just people gathered together praising the Lord for his deliverance at the Red Sea. So we see that congregation. Then there's also, in the New Testament, there's Jesus and the disciples at the Last Supper. Jesus and disciples at the Last Supper. Matthew chapter 26, verse 30. And when they had sung an hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So we find small groups singing together, the group of disciples with the Lord Jesus. We find large groups singing together. We find choirs. We find individuals. But then we also find singing in the early church through the example of Paul and Silas, as I already mentioned, and through the letters of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to Colossae, as he wrote to Ephesus, and he said very similar things of teaching, admonishing, and praising the Lord together with song from our heart. Finally, I, be an injustice to leave this out, consider the book of Psalms. <laughs> the book of Psalms. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, The word psalms is the anglicized version or anglicized form of a Greek word, which really means a poem set to music. The Hebrew title of the book was simply Praises or Book of Praises. It is preeminently the worship book of the Hebrew people and consists of a collection of songs which express the attitude of the soul in the presence of God when contemplating past history, existing conditions, or prophetic hopes. We have the book of Psalms, a whole lot of music for the people of Israel. As you can see, worshipers of God can be found singing their praises in the Bible. And this tradition, this pattern, perhaps would be a better word, has continued throughout church history. I, I want to give you a quick rundown of congregational singing in church history. I have no doubt that Bible-believing churches have enjoyed some form of group singing since the times of the New Testament. 
But it wasn't until the 1500s and the Protestant Reformation that congregational singing began to develop into the rich heritage that it has today. Men like Martin Luther composed simple tunes, one person writes, that were easy to sing and mated them with theologically rich lyrics. Since most people were illiterate in the 16th century, singing became an effective form or method of teaching. Congregants learned about God as they sang about God. Think of some of the songs from back then. A mighty fortress is our God. The pictures, the, the, the word images that are used there to describe God's power, to describe His omnipotence. It was things, songs and words and images that the people could relate to. Congregational singing would continue to develop for the next four centuries. Consider this. There was a technological advance that happened that greatly assisted in uh, congregational singing. That was the printing press. The printing press, it led to an explosion of congregational singing. The first hymnal was printed in 1532, one person wrote, and soon a few dozen hymns became standards across Western Europe. Congregational singing would continue to develop for the next four centuries with psalm paraphrasing and hymns that related to Christian conduct and feelings. Amazing Grace, written by Isaac Watts in 1772, it's a great example, great example of a man pouring out his heart, singing and thanking God for the salvation that he had been given by God's grace. We could move on in history. We could, talk to the, we could talk about the birth of the gospel song and evangelism. We could talk about the Wesleys, Whitfield, Moody, Sankey, Bliss, R.A. Torrey, Fanny Crosby, and many others who wrote songs that were impassioned pleas for repentance and surrender. We can talk about the preachers such as Moody and others, uh, uh, Billy Sunday, who, who uh, the Lord used as great preachers. But what made some of their ministries so powerful is that there were songwriters like R.A. Torrey and P.P. Bliss and others who were, wrote such moving hymns that touched people's hearts. We've shared hymn histories here in the last couple months on, on some of those things. There is no doubt that music and singing in particular is a part of of church history. But why do we sing in our services? Is it something we do simply because it has been done in churches for centuries? I believe that the reasons we sing are far greater than that. I am not, personal opinion here, I am not opposed to tradition just because it's tradition. But I want you, if there is anything you walk out of this service with tonight, it is that the reasons we sing are far greater, far better, far more powerful than just because of tradition, just because it's been done for centuries. In the time remaining, we're going to look at some principles about singing. Some principles about congregational singing, but just about singing here in this service and, and why we do what we do. Businesses give their core values, but tonight I want to take a few moments and share with you why we sing about or of our God. First of all, singing is a means of offering praise to the Lord. Singing is a means of, uh, of offering our praise and of worshiping our God. Now this is the first point. It's probably the longest one in, in my several points here tonight. But let's not gloss over the significance of this Point. Singing is a means of offering praise to the Lord. Psalm 100 and verse number 2. The choir has heard this uh, psalm on several occasions. Psalm 100 and verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Singing. Evidently, the Lord likes our singing. Come before His presence with singing. We see it was established in the temple worship at the dedication, Solomon praise, a wonderful prayer. But as the singers sang, as the trumpeters played, it was then that the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 5. Psalm 47, verse number 6, Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King, sing praises. Do you hear a theme? Do you hear a repetition in that verse? 
sing praises to our God. In Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2, David wrote these words, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. He continues on in Psalm 18. He talks about how that the, the Lord delivered him from his enemies, specifically King Saul, who was hunting him down in the wilderness of Israel. He talks about how the Lord delivers him. But then in verse 49, near the end of Psalm 18, he says this in verse 49, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Few of us in this room, I imagine, are as poetic as David. Maybe some of you are. Poetry is not my strong point. Few of us probably are as poetic as David. But as children of God, we share that same heartfelt desire, I trust, to express our praise, our worship, and our adoration of which He is worthy. We want to express that. We can do that through song, as the words and music express the feeling of our hearts. I look at Psalm, 1, I look at Psalm 18, I read those first two verses, I'm like, wow, I wish I had written that. Describing the Lord as my high tower, my buckler, my shield, the horn of my salvation. He's so poetic, he's so descriptive. Brings so many images to mind to think about the character of our God. But I'm not poetic like he is. I'll tell you what, though. I have that same heartfelt desire to express my praise. And I can do it through song. So can you. So can you. One person wrote this, and I thought this was powerful. He said, Music often can form the expressions which the individual may feel awkward speaking on his own. His point was, maybe you aren't as poetic as David. Maybe you aren't as, uh, as uh, outgoing, as, as transparent in your feelings and in the emotions of your heart and in expressing the pray, your praise to God. Maybe you don't have quite that knack for putting words together to, to fitly explain your feelings, to fitly express the feelings and expressions of your heart concerning your God. Maybe you're not like David in saying all those things. But as you sing in this service, that is where those feelings, those thoughts, those desires concerning God can be expressed through song. Maybe you sometimes don't know how to express your feelings or your praise of Him. Maybe you struggle to give a public testimony. I think we can all identify with those things. But hear this. Congregational singing lays all of those fears and difficulties aside. Where we as one body, as one church family, together lift up our voices in praise and singing about and to our God. Congregational singing gives you the opportunity to express that praise. Singing. It's a means of offering praise to the Lord. Secondly, singing is a means of proclaiming truth. Get this. Your singing matters. Your singing is important. You're expressing, you're proclaiming truth to one another, to your brothers and sisters in Christ, to any visitors who may come. Hey, for someone who's unchurched, maybe you have heard a mighty fortress is our God. Maybe you've heard that a hundred times. But for someone who is not used to independent Baptist churches, who has not grown up in church, to come in, the song service is a very different thing. And by the way, that can be true of religious people too. You can have a Catholic come in here. You could have a Hindu come in here. You could have someone from a religious background who may be used to religious uh, 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 practices. But when they come in this service and they hear congregational singing, that is a new thing to many of them. And they are hearing the gospel given. 
they are hearing God's character expounded. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. All right. I, the songs that we sing, they can hear songs of challenging them to come to repentance, to turn to Christ. They can hear songs about God's character. They can hear songs of salvation. They can hear songs of joy. They can hear songs of sorrow, songs of reflection. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Songs of comfort. All these things. It's very new to the unchurched person. But oh, how beautiful as you lift your voice in song, proclaiming truth. We can do that together in congregational singing. Music, one person said, should provide an atmosphere for thinking about spiritual things. Meditation. Chances are, like most Americans, I'm afraid, chances are you have a hard time meditating. You have a hard time pausing, slowing down your day, clearing out your schedule, and just stopping to reflect on the Lord. As we sing, that is a great opportunity to do that. It provides an atmosphere for thinking about spiritual things. The music ministry of this church and specifically the song service, is designed to help you meditate on God. But ultimately, it's up to you to do that. And every part of our song service, our objective is to proclaim truth, whether through the choir, whether through special music, or when a piano number is played. The whole objective is to proclaim truth about the beauty of God, about the character of God, whether it's sung or whether it's played by our instrumentalists at all ought to proclaim and reflect the character of God. Our objective is to proclaim truth about who God is, about His character. So I challenge you, make sure you're listening, because the Holy Spirit will take what is being sung or played and remind you of biblical truth through that music. God will use music to proclaim truth for conviction. Men and women have been moved to repent of their sins because of songs that they have heard. So let your heart be stirred by the music. Let your heart be stirred by the songs that are sung. We do not do what we do here just to fill time. It is to help guide your thoughts concerning the, the future glories of heaven, concerning the sufferings of our Savior. Pay attention to the services. Sometimes there will be themes, but... Pay attention to, to what is being said, whether it's songs of joy or songs of meditation. It's all designed to make you think. Let your heart be moved by the music. God will use music for conviction. He'll use it for edification. Music, singing, teaches. Singing teaches. In the home, Parents, you want to know an easy way to teach your children about God in the home? Play godly Christian music. They'll pick it up. They'll hear it. They can be sitting on the floor playing Legos, and suddenly they'll start chiming along. And you'll be like, I didn't know you knew that song. <laughs> they'll do that. God uses music for edification to teach in the home, in the church, it amazes me how much children can pick up music in particular. And I'm so grateful for our teachers that really use that as a tool for teaching in our children's ministries. Sing. Sing. Sing in the home. Play music in the home. Sing in the church. Listen to the music of the church. Let it stir your heart. Sing. Let your children, let these teenagers see you passionately lift up your voice in praise of the one who has set you free from sin. Because he is worthy. He needs, our, our teenagers, our children, but especially our teenagers, need to see your heart stirred regarding your God. They need to see that you don't just come here just to do it, just because you've always done it. They need to see that passion. Maybe you can't sing very well. Let the passion come out in your heart. Let the passion be stirred in your heart. Let it come through in song as you proclaim truth, as you praise the Lord and worship Him. Singing 
Not only these things, but thirdly, singing is a means of testifying of our God. Every now and then we have testimony times. We'll take during a Sunday evening service, we'll take an opportunity. Hey, who has a testimony to share? Sometimes people tell about their salvation. Sometimes people tell, hey, here's how God has provided for me recently. Well, I tell you, every time we have a song service, every service, we are testifying of our God. Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas singing in the prison. They were testifying of their God. What does it say? What's the very last phrase in Acts 16, 25? And the prisoners heard them. <laughs> Captive audience, right? <laughs> They were testifying of their God, and these prisoners were hearing the truths about the God that they believed in. Singing is a means of testifying of our God. And fourthly, singing is a means of expressing joy. Singing is a means of expressing joy. It's a means of expressing the feelings of our heart, but in particular I say joy because of what is said in James chapter 5, Verse number 13, here in the closing verses of his letter, James writes, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. <laughs> Singing is a means of expressing our feelings regarding God. Singing is a means of expressing joy. Are you rejoicing in the Lord over something that He has done in your life? Then sing. Sing out. Sing with gusto. Singing is a means of expressing the feelings of your heart, and that is why we sing a variety of hymns. That is one reason why we learn new songs, like this morning. We learned a new song of praise to God. Most of y'all in here had not heard that song, hadn't, uh, weren't familiar with it at least, but it was a song of praise. And we're going to go back and we'll bring it out again. We'll keep working at it. We'll learn it. It's good. It's appropriate. Let's learn songs together about our God that praise and that uplift Him. Some of the songs we sing are songs of praise, like what we had this morning. Others are songs of testimony, talking about the trials of life. Singing is a means of expressing joy. It is a means of expressing the feelings of our heart. Core values. Businesses spend all kinds of money to train their employees on their core values about the principles that they espouse, the things that they believe. But sometimes it's necessary here at New Testament Baptist Church for us to be reminded of why we do what we do. Tonight it's been why we sing of our God, why we lift up our voice in song, why we have congregational singing. Go travel. Well, I was going to say go visit other churches, but I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> Go do a perusal of Christendom at large. Catholics, Episcopalians, all these different denominations. Go look at what the Hindus do. Go look at what all different religions out there do. And I'll tell you, congregational singing is a unique and beautiful thing. If I could go on a rabbit trail for a minute, I want you to know, my personal favorite type of music in this church is the congregational singing. You've heard me tell you that before. I love hearing you sing. Why? Some of the reasons why I love congregational singing so much, it's because we're all doing it together. Amen. We are united as a church family. I trust we're all thinking about the same thing, you know, the context, the, the, the words, the thoughts, the meditations of the song. We're all doing it together. We're united we're all praising the Lord. And so there's that unity there. Uh, uh, but, but ultimately, as we do that, it's all directed at God. <laughs> You're not looking at me necessarily. You're not looking at one individual person. There's nothing wrong with special music. We have it. We have a choir. That's good. They're, they're leading us in worship. I'm so thankful for their ministry. But when we all sing together, it equally... As pastor's message said this morning, it equally decreases us. It all increases him. I love congregational singing. I love it. It, of all the kind of music that we have, perfectly fulfills the principles that we've laid out here, the four points that we've looked at. Maybe you're thinking, Pastor Tim, 
This has been a very nice lecture on singing in the local church. But what is your point? What is your call to action? All right, well, here it is. I'm so glad you asked. Two things really quick. Number one, I encourage you to participate. And you folks do, and I am grateful for that. I encourage you to participate, though. If you are physically able to sing, then sing. I don't mind if you have great ability or minimal ability. If you have praise in your heart, then sing. Sing. Sing with gusto, sing with feeling, sing with passion. Lift your voice and allow your soul to express its praise of your God. So number one, participate. But secondly, sing from your heart. Sing from your heart. Young people, those of you that have grown up in church, this is a struggle point. Because I can relate. I had the blessing, I had the privilege of growing up in church, singing songs from as early as I could remember. And the battle is constantly for it to be just, we're singing this song again. Don't let it be like that. Sing from your heart. Sing to God. Through song, tell Him how much you love Him. Through song, tell everyone around you how great He is. Through song, give testimony to His power in your life. Through song, rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Through song, unite with your church family and exalt our God together. Sing from your heart. Sing from your heart. Why we sing praise to our God. Why we sing to Him. Trust that this has been a blessing to you tonight. I'm going to close in prayer, and then we, we're going to have a song. Let's pray. Our Father, thank You so much for the Word of God, for the examples that we see in Scripture concerning singing. We see individuals. We sing choirs. We, we, we see congregations and groups. Lord, singing has been a part of church history throughout the centuries. And Lord, we see principles from Scripture on why we do what we do in this matter. I pray, Lord, that for this church family, we won't just do it out of routine, but that we will do it from our heart, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. God, help us. Help us to never just get into a rut in this matter of praising our God through song. Thank you so much.